and if they do, they will likely uh, drop dead. It's like it's instantly poisonous just from touching the stone. The stone itself, the magic within the stone, ironically enough, uh, is deadly to most people, to most creatures. So, uh, yeah, and uh, if, if they don't immediately die from handling the stone, they pretty much fall into a catatonic state and can either be killed or, you know, left crippled until someone comes along and helps them or whatever. The goblin dove at Flint, hoping to knock him down. Flint swung his axe with a deadly accuracy and timing. The goblin head rolled into the dust, the body crashing to the ground. What are you slime doing in Solus? Tannis asked, meeting a clumsy stab of another goblin skillfully. The swords crossed and held for a moment, then Tannis shoved the goblin backward. Do you work for the high theocrat? Theocrat? The goblin gurgled with laughter, swinging its weapon wildly at, uh, at it. Uh, swinging its weapon wildly, it ran at Tannis. That fool, our few master works for the. Ugh! The teacher impaled. Uh, the teacher. The creature impaled itself on Tannis' sword. It groaned and slid off <laughs> onto the ground. Tannis swore and stared at the dead goblin in frustration. The clumsy idiot! I didn't want to kill it! Just find out who hired it! <laughs> Sometimes it's like that in D and D. You'll find out who hired us sooner than you'd like," snarled another goblin, rushing at the distracted half elf. Tennis turned quickly and disarmed the creature. He kicked it in the stomach, and the goblin crumpled over. Another goblin sprang at Flint before the dwarf had time to recover its lethal swing. He staggered backwards, trying to regain his balance. Then Tessel Hall's shrill voice rang out: "These scum will fight for anyone, Tennis. Throw some dog meat." Once in a while, and they're yours forever. Dog meat. The goblin croaked, and turned uh, turned from Flint in outrage. Well, in a rage. How about Kinder meat, you little squeaker? The goblin flapped toward the apparently unarmed Kinder. <laughs> his purplish red hands grasping for his neck. Tass, without ever losing the innocent childlike expression on his face, reached into his fleecy vest, whipped out a dagger, and threw it. All in one motion. The goblin clutched his chest and fell with a groan. There was a sound of flapping feet as he re as the remaining goblin fled. The battle was over. Tan sheathed its sword, grimacing in disgust at the stinking bodies. The smell reminded him of rotting fish. Flint wiped black goblin blood from his axe blade. Tad stared mournfully at the body of the goblin he had, uh, he killed. It had fallen face down, his dagger buried underneath. I'll get it for you, Tannis offered, preparing to roll the body over. No, Tannis made a face. I don't want it back. You can never get rid of the smell, you know. Tannis nodded. Flint fastened his axe and in its carrier again, and three continued on the pa uh, down the path. The lights of Solus grew brighter as the darkness deepened. The smell of the wood smoke and the chilled night air brought uh, thoughts of food and warmth and safety. The companions hurried their steps. They did not speak for a long time. Each hearing Flint's words echo in his mind, goblins, and Solus. Finally, however, the irrepressible Kinder giggled. Besides, he said, that dagger was Flint's. That, really, that's awesome. I kind of want to make a character like um, Tass. So I'm going to have a quick bathroom break. I will be right back.
All right. I have returned. Take another sip of my drink while I uh, prepare myself. For more reading. Ah, that's so good. Well, it's gotten a little cold. And that is most unfortunate because this stuff is way better when it's hot, hot, hot. So I think I'll read one more chapter and then I'll take a break from reading and uh, do some uh, some drawing. Yeah. All right. So, ooh, another. Uh, let's see. It's kind of hard to see. Another illustration. But that is what the end looks like. You turn to the end. The shock. The oath is broken. I wish I could uh, speak like that more often, but I can't. Uh, at least not until my voice is properly warmed up. I mean, I've been up since uh, almost seven. So four hours later, my voice is still not warmed up. But anyway, let's continue on, shall we? See. Nearly everyone in Solas managed to drop into the inn of the last home sometime during the evening hours these days. People felt safer in crowds. Solas had long been a crossroads for travelers. They came northeast from Haven, the secret capital. They came from the Elven Kingdom of Qualinesti to the south. Sometimes they came from the east, across the barren plains of Abanasinia. Blah. Abanasinia. Abanasinia. Man, that's hard to say. That's a lot of vowels. Throughout the civilized world, the end of the last home was known as the Traveler's Refuge and Center for News. It was to the end. Yeah. It was to the end that the three friends turned their steps. The huge convoluted tree trunk rose through the surrounding trees against the shadow of the valley wood. The colored panes of the end stained glass windows glittered brightly, and the sounds of life drifted down from the, uh, from the windows. Lanterns hanging from the tree limbs lit the winding stairway. Though the autumn night air or night was still a uh, settling chill, Amid the valen woods of Solus, the travelers felt their companionship and memories warmed the soul and wash away the aches and sorrows of the road. The inn was so crowded on this night that the three were continually forced to stand aside on the chairs so that men, women, and children passed them. Tanis noticed that the people glanced at him and his companions with suspicion, not with the welcoming looks they would have given five years ago. Tanis's face grew grim. This was not the um, homecoming he had dreamed about. Never in the fifty years he had lived in Solus had he felt such tension. The rumors he had heard about the malignant corruption of the Seekers must be true. Five years ago, the men calling themselves Seekers, we seek the new gods, had been a loose-knit organization of clerics practicing their new religion in the towns of Haven, Solus, and gateway. These clerics had been misguided, Tannis believed, but at least they had been honest and sincere. In the intervening years, however, 
Clerics had gained more and more status as their religion flourished. Soon, they became concerned not so much with the glory of the afterlife as with the power of Kryn. They took over the governing of the towns with the people's blessing. A touch on Tannis' arm interrupted his thoughts. He turned and saw Flint silently pointing below. Looking down, Tannis saw guards marching past, walking in parties of four. Armed to the teeth, they strutted with an air of self-importance. At least they're human, not goblins, Tass said. That, gob uh, that goblin sneered when I mentioned the high theocrat, Tannis mused. As if they were working for someone else. I wonder what's going on. Maybe our friends will know, Flint said. If they're here, Tassoloff added. A lot could have happened in five years. They'll be here, if they're alive, Flint added, in an undertone. It was a sacred oath we took, to meet again after five years had passed, and report what we had found out about the evil spreading in the world. To think we should come home and find evil on our very doorsteps. Hush! Shh! Several passerby looked so alarmed at the dwarf's words, the tan shook his head. Better not talk about it here, the half-elf half advised. Reaching the top of the stairs, Taz flung the door open wide. A wave of light, noise, heat, and familiar smell of Odic's spicy potatoes hit them full in the face. Pow, right in the kisser. It engulfed them and washed over them soothingly. Odic, standing behind the bar, as they always remembered him, hadn't changed, except maybe to grow stouter. The inn didn't appear to have changed either, except to grow more comfortable. Tasselhoff, his quick tender eyes sweeping the crowd, gave a yell and pointed across the room. Something else hadn't changed either, a firelight gleaming on the brightly polished winged dragon helm. Who is it? Flynn asked, there, it is raining to see. Caramon, Tannis replied. And Raceland will be here too, Flint said without a great deal of warmth in his voice. Tasselhoff was already sliding through the muttering knots of people. His small, lithe body barely noticed by those he passed. Tannis hoped fervently the kinder wasn't acquiring any objects from the inn's customers. Not that he had stole things, Tasselhoff would have been deeply hurt if anyone had accused him of theft. But the kinder had an insatiable curiosity, and various interesting items belong belonging to the people had a, a way of falling into Taz's possession. The last thing Tannis wanted tonight was trouble. He had made a mental, a mental note to have a private word with the kinder. So, yeah. Uh, kinders are kleptomaniacs. That is to say, they can't help themselves but steal. They don't even see it as stealing, because it's so natural to them. They understand the connotation of stealing as being wholly negative, but they don't see what they do as being negative, or illegal, or anything. You know, things just happen to fall in their possession somehow. But anyway, there are different editions of uh, Dungeons & Dragons. The latest being fifth, which um, I have not yet read through, even though I own the player's handbook for it. But up until three point five, at least, uh, kinders were very frowned upon, especially to play, to be a player character and a kinder, because. They had no choice but to be clapped, uh, clapped 